Okay, we are now recording. So I'm going to ask everybody, is there anything that, uh, any questions you have about the lesson, about um, projects or anything like that? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so like I said last class, like I couldn't um, reach out to two of my group members. So me and my other member, we wanted to know if we could just complete the um, evaluation on each other. Is okay. Are, are you interested in just uh, sticking with your topic? Um, yeah. Okay. So you, you two um, are, <laughs> two of you are going to work together and, and complete it together, right? Yeah. We just didn't know if you would like take points off because two of them were missing. Nope. Nope. That's not going to affect you at all. So if uh, yeah, you let me know um, who you, uh, it, through your evaluation and actually it, Alexis, if you could email uh, James and myself, um, to let us know um, who has not shown up because uh, I don't obviously don't want to give people credit if they're not doing the work. Uh, so note it in your evaluations who uh, who in your list hasn't done anything and uh, send an email to me and what I'll do is I'll remove them from from your groups and if anybody else is going through the same thing if you've uh, trying to connect with somebody especially by the end of this week when the assignment is due if they have not contact you contacted you or contributed to this week's group assignment then then let me and James know so we can we can take action or remove them from the group because obviously we don't want to give people credit for work that they're not doing um, and I'll leave it up to you. I'm, I'm going to say that this task, th this final project is easily done with three people. Um, some of my upper level classes, I have a very similar project that they do uh, about the same length and um, they, they have eight weeks to do it. Uh, and, and of course, they're a little bit more prepared to do this stuff because they've, they've done this stuff before. Um, but it is a very easy task to do throughout uh, 15 weeks, if that makes sense. But if for whatever reason you go below three people in your group um, and you wish to be reassigned or something like that uh, or incorporated into another group, let me know, okay? I'll try to reach out to them uh, again and I'll just let you know. Say again? I'll try to reach out to them again and I'll just let you know. Okay, sounds good. Anya? I have a question too. Um, how do we go about like picking a topic? Like, do we just, is it just anything from like what we learned or like, is it a broader, you know? I don't know if you know what I mean, but how I, I do, do we go about that? Yeah, so uh, you're, you're gonna have two options here. You can either come up with an observational research, which means you can look, if you wanna observe uh, you know, people in their environments, and in this case, it would be uh, children. Um, obviously, you're, you're not going to be able to interact in any way because that would be a completely separate approval process. But let me give you an example, what I explained to my other classes that are doing a similar project. Say you want to observe um, what particular age range and, and gender uh, tend to roll through stop signs, okay? If you have somebody sitting at, uh, across the corner, across the street, and observing people that roll through stop sign versus people that stop through stop signs, and just marking uh, uh, who, uh, you know, what age range you think they are, or what gender uh, you think they are, um, and then tallying that up to come up with a conclusion. That's an observation. Now, uh, what you can't do in, in this example, especially, is taking down the stop sign to see how many people get into accidents, you know, because now you're affecting your environment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you can do is a research topic, a research paper, which um, in, entails taking two theories. And I think I used this example on Tuesday with this group is say we know that um, uh, more urban areas tend to have lead, more higher levels of lead in their water. Um, we also know that lead leads to cognitive development issues with children. So say you know those two things and you can go out and you can research through the Kemp Library to find these things, um, but you wanna theorize that uh, urban schools have uh, uh, lower GPAs and you think it might have something to do with cognitive delays. So you take the lead in the water um, and cognitive delays due to lead and now you've got another theory. So you can research all that stuff through Kemp Library to, to see if there is some kind of correlation um, and, and then report that through 
through your paper and presentation. Okay. Okay. That, so when I like, when we pick a topic, am I okay to come to you and ask you if like it's an okay topic or anything? Um, you're, you're going to actually be doing that through your assignment this week. So okay. that, that you're going to propose what, what topic, uh, your, your group is going to choose. And if it's, if it's, uh, something that's not acceptable, I'll let you know through feedback. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. I had a question about the project too. All right, go ahead, Kirsten. Um, I was wondering if we're allowed to use the textbook as one of our three sources. Um, for now, yes. Um, okay. The problem with that is the textbook's going to be very, very limited. On uh, you know, you can probably get an idea from that, uh, and you can certainly use that in in the uh, uh, in your your report. But at the end of this, your group should have no less than really eight sources. This is a, a pretty sizable project, um, so pulling a lot of information from the textbook might limit what uh, what uh, your organization you're supporting of your thesis and, and all that. Okay. So be very ca uh, cautious of that. You can use your book if it's, if it's some, a little bit of information that uh, you find from there, but for the most part, a lot of your, your efforts are going to be pulled from the Kemp library from those journal articles. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I have a question too. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so if we do like the observations, does everyone in the group have to do like an observation or can it just be, one person does it and then they report their findings to the group. However you want to set it up. You really have a wide berth of, of who does what. Uh, I'm not assigning roles in any way. I'm not saying anybody's going to be a leader or a writer or a presenter. However you want to do that to get the best product of, available, I'm leaving that up to you. Okay. Okay. And then if we wanted to like observe children per se, because um, I'm an early childhood and special education major. So if I want to do like something with that, I have my clearances. Could I like go into a school? Like, would that be okay with you? Um, you, you mean going to a school that you're not uh, a part of? Yeah. Um, is there another way that you can do that? I, I, I here, here's, I'll tell you what, let me, let me say this. If, if you have connections that you can, uh, that you can observe without interfering, um, or need an IRB from either ESU or uh, from, because we're not doing IRBs. This is just like yeah. a little, uh, a, 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 you know, a quick little observation uh, yeah. project. So if, if you can do that without any kind of interference or anything that requires an IRB, then I would say go ahead. Okay, because I mean, I have to do observations anyway for my other classes in school. Mm -hmm. So like I could just like observe, I, it's just an option. It's not necessarily. Okay, okay. Yeah, and, and no recording. That, that, that would be my yeah, other yeah. thing. Yeah, no, no recording. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> All right, thank you. You're welcome. I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, so just to clarify, what part of the project is due like this week? This week is just very simple. You're going to be connecting with your groups. You're going to uh, figure out how you're going to overcome obstacles because many of you are working 40 hour work weeks uh, and going to school full time and probably have families. So if that's your case, how is your group going to overcome obstacles and connecting and, and getting through uh, to collaborate and get this project done? Um, you're also going to start generating, again, come up with, with at least three sources and you can do that through Kemp Library, through other uh, credible sources. Now, what's not credible? Wikipedia is not credible. Uh, anything that might have a, a bias uh, associated with it, for example, uh, you know, anything .com is probably questionable. But if you have a .edu, any websites with .edu, most .orgs are, are pretty good. And I think just about, uh, uh, you know, .govs are probably pretty good too. So be skepti uh, skeptical of uh, dot coms, anything that's dot com. Um, so just make sure that they're credible and they're scientific and, and you should be good with that. And then the other part is just generating an idea of what your, your, you think your topic's going to be. Are you going to do observation or are you going to do a research article or research uh, paper? Okay. Okay. And do you want us to like hand, do you want us to like hand in the um, sources? Your sources, since this is going to be an APA format, you're, you're going to answer, address all those issues on the assessment assignment four. Um, I'm sorry, project 
project number two, not assignment four. So answer all those, uh, address all those areas uh, in APA format. And at the end of the APA, for, APA format, you'll have a reference page, a separate reference page, and you'll list alphabetically, uh, make sure that they're in the correct format um, on, on that reference page. If you need help, contact the tutor. Uh, I don't think we have an assigned tutor here, but if you reach the tutoring service, and I provided a link within our D2L, it's along the top menu. Um, just get in touch with the tutoring center or the writing center and they'll help you with your format just to make sure that you have it right. And that's gonna be very important, uh, especially for the final project because I'm gonna be grading pretty heavily on whether, you, whether or not you adhere to the, the format, okay? Thank you. Is that in the pack back assignment the only two assignments do or is there more? You have assignment four, you have pack back, you have quiz four, uh, then you have your group project, which your group will, uh, you'll have one person from your group that's going to hand that in. So make sure you collaborate and know who's going to be turning that in. And then on top of that, you're going to have to do peer evaluations. So uh, evaluate yourself, evaluate everybody else in your group. And that's also in week four assessments. So you got a, uh, quite a few things due this week. So uh, be prepared. Don't get the Sunday night and realize that you have so much due and, and you forget some of it. You said you fixed that issue with the peer evaluations because you said, I guess last class, that everyone could see the peer evaluations. You said you fixed them. Yes, I did, I did uh, uh, fix that. And that, that was my summer class. That was a, you know, a quick little mistake, but it should be good now. Yeah, everything you put in the evaluations will be private. All right, any other questions? Um, do you think you could just explain a little bit about the uh, belief assignment? About, about which assignment? The assignment where like we have to say about the belief and like why has it changed like the Santa or religion or... Okay, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but are you talking about assignment number four? Yeah. Okay, let me into that and, and look at it. All right, so for this week, the assignment is going to be um, <clears throat> All right, uh, e equilibration, equi uh, e equilibration, sorry, <laughs> equilibrium. <laughs> um, yeah, so what we, we talked about this on, on Tuesday, and if you kind of need a refresher, I think the, uh, the recording is up now, but remember a time, um, so the, the assignment's saying, remember a time when you were confronted with information or evidence that forced you to reevaluate something that you believe to be true. Uh, and it gives you an example in here, like uh, Santa Claus, religion, whatever that might be. So if you remember um, back in, in, on Tuesday, we talked about um, how we kind of like things to be packaged in, in uh, compartments for us, right? Or, or uh, schemes or schemas. Uh, but everything that we know and that we learn and experience goes into these nice little packages. And sometimes we experience something new that is outside of that. So we go through this process, according to Piaget, we go through this process of accommodation and assimilation. So if we are assimilating, we are gonna look for like, pro, uh, like qualities and we're gonna, going to make assumptions based on those qualities. However, if we learn that, uh, for example, I use the example of my, my daughter who thought my dog, um, uh, thought anything with four legs and fur was a dog and she saw a cow and she pointed and said, dog. So at that point, you know, she was assimilating. But when I confronted her on that, and I wasn't mean about it, I just, I, I just redirected her um, understanding of what that was. And I said, no, that, that's a cow. This is a dog. This is a cow. And that was a learning moment for her. So she went through a process of what's called accommodation, uh, where she had to learn something new. That's di uh, dis, uh, equi <laughs> um, um, uh, equilibration disequilibration. 
I have a hard time saying that word today. Um, so she is learning something new because it's causing stress. It's causing a conflict with what she knows. So kind of think of that in your own personal situation where um, you experienced this uh, equilibrium, where it, it wasn't, you, know, you felt a little bit of stress and you had to learn something new and think outside the box to come up with a different conclusion compared to what you knew from your previous experiences. Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah, yeah. It's Thank you. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. All right, any other questions? Okay, all right, so what I'd like to do today, I don't know where to put my pencil. Um, so I wanna cover just a, a couple other principles, a couple other concepts here with information processing and core domains. And I'm gonna go through those. Um, you know, there, there's really not a whole lot to information processing and core domains was a pretty big module in your book. However, we're really gonna be hitting upon a lot of these uh, core domains throughout the, the semester. So I'm not gonna really go too much in depth. I'm just gonna kind of give you the brief synopsis of what core domains are, the theories behind them. And then, um, and then I'm going to give you an exercise to, to see where you, uh, where you all fall with uh, uh, your understanding with this. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you. All right. So hopefully... I don't know why that didn't center. All right, so um, when we talk about information processing, we're talking about how uh, some of the theories that we have, how information uh, gets into our, our um, into our senses, into our brain, and then we process that and memorize that and learn from that, and then store into our long-term memory and retrieve that for, uh, for later. So the best example that we had, in fact, it's, it's kind of neat how we, uh, in, um, we created computers, we invented computers in our own image, in our own understanding of how um, our memory systems work. And then interestingly, we revert back to the computer to explain how our information systems work, okay? Our memory systems work. So as you can see here, and, and many of you that uh, work with computers and you know computers, you have here your information input, right? So that's information that comes into your mind, into your, in through your senses, either through sight, sound, uh, touch, smell, taste, however. Um, and in your computer, we know these as input devices. So these could be keyboards, DVDs, mouse, um, whatever, or any information that you're putting into your computer, right? So very similar to information input here through your um, uh, through your language, through, through vision. So that goes into, um, well, this likens our input devices with our sen uh, sensory memory. So our sensory memory um, is very short term. Uh, it, we, we know them as echoic and iconic memories. So for example, we have roughly a few seconds, and many of you can relate to this, that you've heard somebody say something and you weren't, really weren't paying attention. Your attentional focus wasn't on them, but you heard it. And then a couple of seconds later, you turned around and said, well, I, I, did you just say something? Did you say my name? Um, but that's echoic memory because it goes into your sensory memory and it, and it lingers there for just a few minutes. Um, I, I think also, um, I, I may have used the example here, but no, oh, actually I didn't, not for this class. But if I flash something on the screen and then moved off and then asked you, uh, what you saw flash on the screen, some of you would say, oh yeah, I, I saw this word or I saw this number. Um, that's iconic memory. And again, this is kind of a buffer. It just goes into the short term and it only lasts for a couple seconds and then, then it's usually gone. Um, so why do those, why do those, uh, why does that information not get absorbed, do you think? Why can't we take in everything Any guesses? Anybody? Crickets. Um, I feel like I think it isn't that important. <laughs> right. We, we have to be selective on what we bring into 
our working memory and our long-term memory. While our long-term memory is not, it, it's unlimited, there's no real tape, unlike a hard drive, right? A hard drive has a finite amount of space, like one terabyte or two terabyte. I can remember, <laughs> I'm dating myself here, but um, I, I remember when the average hard drive space was 52 megabytes. That's not very much, okay? Um, I, I think uh, just in a second of a video right now, that's all that is. But um, we, are, uh, we don't look at our hard drive, uh, our memory as our hard drive. Our hard drive is finite amount of space. Our long-term memory is limitless. Um, that doesn't mean certain things don't fall off, but it, it really is, um, there's no quantity, amount, set amount of uh, information that can go in that, that limits us, okay? So anyway, information comes in, and as somebody mentioned, um, we, we can't absorb everything. It's not within our capacity. So we have to select what we pay attention to, what's important to us, why, uh, what's relevant to us, what might uh, interfere with our routine operations. So based on that, we may encode just a few things into our working memory, okay? Just as information up here goes into our RAM. Now, if you know anything about RAM, it's this constant switching. It, it uh, stores uh, a good amount of information and it, it, uh, it's what comes up on your screen, what you're working on right now. And it's very important as far as what you're doing in that moment, okay? So similar to our working memory or our short-term memory. Our short-term memory, our STM, uses what is relevant for us within, now, on average, I think it's about seven minutes. So everything that you use within seven minutes is constantly being molded around in your working memory, your short-term memory. And we call that rehearsal, okay? So whatever we're using at that moment, we are rehearsing. We're, we're uh, working the, the numbers, like if you get a math problem, you're constantly um, thinking about the numbers, you're processing, you're, you're uh, doing a lot of logic with that information until it's solidified, or you don't need it anymore. Depending on how much you rehearse it, it goes into our long-term memory pretty strongly, similar to your RAM versus your storage. So let's say, for example, you're working on your computer and you're, you're creating your week four assignment and um, you're ready to save it and you don't really, uh, you're waiting for the other group members to chime in on it. So what you're going to do, you've worked it, you've, you've rehearsed it, and now you're going to send that to your long-term memory. You, sh you close out the file, you go get dinner or whatever, and then you come back after a couple hours to, to work on it again, all right? So what you did is you just stored it in your, your, heart, your long, uh, long-term memory, or LTM, or on your hard drive, which we'll call your LTM, okay, until you're ready to use it again. And when you are, you re-engage in this rehearsal, you know, either through, and, and again, you're going through your sensory memory, so maybe you have an alarm or something that you're, you're going to remind yourself. So that triggers your working memory to say, hey, I need to retrieve something from my long-term memory, all right? Similar to if you're working on a file, you click, uh, open your hard drive, you click on the file, and you start working on it again, okay? Does that make sense to you? So again, yes. this, this process is called information processing model. And it'll help you to understand this, especially when we, uh, did, did we do, we didn't talk about learning yet, right? I think that's next week. So next week, uh, when we get into learning, this will make uh, a little bit more sense because we're gonna put this into to practice, all right? So how does information processing coincide with core domain? So last week, I taught you about Piaget's model uh, and uh, Vygotsky's social, soci sociocultural perspectives, right? Those are two models that we rely pretty heavily on today to explain how cognitive development and um, uh, sociocultural development occur with, with children. 
Um, there, are, there are several other theories, but I think your book highlights another one called, oh, oh not care domain. Core domain. Theories, okay? Oh, can't spell today. So our core domains, uh, uh, core domain theories, um, really uh, capture how we 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 start off with learning a language, and based on that language, we start applying um, uh, verbalization. Uh, we start remembering things in in terms of language. We start learning things in terms of language. Okay, um, and and language is pretty automatic as we cover in chapter nine, um, because it's a big process. It's a big part of of how we form our intelligence, how we uh, navigate and negotiate certain obstacles in the world, uh, growth, learning, everything. Everything is based around how we communicate. Um, and sometimes that can go wrong, which I'll talk about here shortly. So language is really the first step of core domain. It's the center, it's the focus of how we get the other three, how we get the uh, three core domains of, of knowledge, okay? And those three core domains are objects, people, and uh, living things. Now, Piaget focused more on objects and living things and kind of put things as, a, as a stages, as sequential stages that we learn these things. Um, according to core domain theories, all three of these things happen almost simultaneously. They, they coincide with each other. So, for example, objects. We learn at a young age, we learn like this rudimentary uh, foundation of physics, okay? We, we haven't ha actually take, taken physics courses, but if you think about it, as a baby, uh, many of you can speak from, from your own experiences, either having kids or watching kids, what do we know about physics at a, at a young age? What can we, what can we hypothesize? At, at a young we age? know about gravity. Right. We know that things fall because of gravity, right? We may not know what the term is for gravity. We may not have an uh, understanding of orbital mechanics, but we know gravity uh, <laughs> sucks sometimes, right? Uh, what, other, uh, what other things do we know when, uh, about objects? Friction. Friction, okay. If we, what about friction? Like, um, or like even like static. Like, let's say we go down the slide as, like, a little kid. We don't quite know why, but our hair will, like, stick up. Okay, okay. So we may have discovered electricity in our own way, right? So we shuffle our, our booties on the floor. Uh, uh, booties, like the, 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 you know, you know what I mean. Um, uh, uh, the shoes, okay, um, uh, or socks. And we, we shuffle those on the floor, and we our hair gets frizzy or something, or we might get a shock on something. We discover that through just experimentation, right? Friction, maybe it's harder to pull our toys across, our heavier toys, when there's carpeting versus linoleum. So we learn basic physics as children, okay? So what about people? What do you think we learn? And we're going to call this, um, uh, we'll call this folk psychology. I think that's a term your book used anyway. Folk psychology. So what do we know about, uh, all of us know about people, right? We know how to interact with people. We sometimes know that uh, uh, people are approachable or they're unapproachable. But as a child, what do you think, uh, what are some of the things that you might establish as, as folk psychology with people? Um, I think it's like you can tell by their emotions, I guess. People okay. emotions. Okay, okay. Maybe we are starting to explore a little bit with what emotions are, right? Um, we talked about uh, Piaget's model of uh, egocentrism, 
We know that we're angry. We get upset sometimes. We know that we're happy sometimes. We know that we're sad sometimes. And, and the world around us tends to, uh, uh, we identify with it being the same thing until we break out of that egocentrism and we understand that other people have their own independent emotions and their own independent thoughts. So maybe they're discovering that sometimes when uh, mom or dad uh, or brother or sister are angry, um, they, they get a little bit loud or they might uh, cross their arms or something because we're very facial focused, right? We start observing people's faces. So we, you're right, absolutely. We start discovering emotions. We may not have the words for them yet. We may not have the, the education for what emotions are, but we understand them. We understand when somebody's mad, maybe you don't want to approach them. We understand when somebody's sad that, they, that you're going to feel comfort and they're going to express comfort when you uh, get near them, right? So emotions are discovered. What about, uh, what else about folk psychology, about people? What do you think? Okay. How they interact with others. How to interact, absolutely. Interacting. Thoughts, people have different thoughts, right? Uh, usually at a young age, uh, uh, around, um, you know, from, zero to two and two to seven, we start acknowledging that maybe somebody, uh, we need help with something and somebody might be better, uh, have better thoughts than us to, to teach us. So we start developing trust versus mistrust uh, around those ages too, right? Um, interestingly enough, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, um, but children that struggle in this domain at a, at a young age, and we can usually detect right around 18 to 24 months um, that don't understand emotions, that, that struggle with interactions, that actually start language a little bit later, their language development a little bit later. What, what, uh, what disorder do you think that, that would fall under? Autism. Autism, ASD, autism spectrum disorder, which we'll cover in, in later chapters. But at, we, we have noticed a correlation that children that, stuck, uh, that struggle with interacting with people um, and grasping the language, or at least showing that they grasp the language, will gravitate more towards objects. They'll, in fact, almost to object permanence we talked about, when a child uh, sees something disappear and they think that it, it ceases to exist, right? negotiating object permanence and understanding just because it's gone, it might be behind something or it might be the last place uh, we, we put it or saw it. Um, that happens actually quicker with children with ASD. Okay. So we'll see a decrease in abilities for people, but we're going to see an increase in ability for objects. So just food for thought. And we're going to talk about that much much later. And of course, living things. Um, of course, people and living things kind of uh, merge, no, not merge, but they, it, it takes a while for us to separate because in the beginning, these are all just one object. These are just one uh, idea uh, for, for children. But as they grow older, they start developing those schemes. And as they develop those schemes, we start expanding on objects. So Again, dogs become horses, dogs, horses, and cows. Um, people become mom and dad or caretaker um, uh, versus grandparents. We start extending out. And then when we get into school, we understand our, our world expands even more. So each one of these fan out as time goes on and becomes more developed and finely tuned. And same way with living things. We understand that things with four legs may be able to run faster than something that doesn't have any legs, like a slug or a snake, right? Um, so we start uh, developing, again, kind of a, a, a uh, rudimentary biological perspective, biological understanding, okay? All right. So any questions on core domain theories or anybody have any any comments on any of this stuff? All right. 
Does this make sense to everybody? Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. So a little bit different, excuse me, like I said, a little bit different than what we explored with Piaget because Piaget was very layered. It was uh, according to age and according to abilities, but we get into core domain. It's all really the same thing and it just fans out. Okay. If that makes sense. All right. So what I would like to do today is uh, just kind of get a sense of how you do in understanding um, information processing versus Piaget, okay? Because these are two different theories, but um, if you go into D2L, I'm, I'm not gonna try and post this, this on chat because it didn't work last time, but if you go into D2L under week four and resources, I have two files, okay? I have uh, case study Piaget and case study information processing. Um, so I would like, let's see here, let's get groups, see how many group breakout rooms we can do. Um, I, I would like for your group to, to go through both of these and you can do either Word document or PDF, whichever works for you. I, I, I put both. I, you'll see four files, but uh, you're only going to need two of them. So Piaget, and information processing, either PDF or Word document, whichever works. Um, so let's, we're gonna, we're gonna have 10 rooms, so about five participants per room. Uh, go through these and, and see how you answer. It's a case study, uh, two of them. So uh, see what you can match up and what you can, you can get, uh, get through with these, okay? And I'll be around from room to room to, to see how you're doing. Let me, before I do that, where is, James, you're here, right? Okay, I'm gonna make you a co-host, make a co-host. There we go. So hopefully you won't get put into a room. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, let's break out rooms. Now, anybody have any questions before we move on? Wait, what case study are we looking at? So uh, it's under week four, under content, week four, resources, you'll see four files at the very bottom of the resource tab. And it says case study, two of them say case study Piaget, and two of them say case study information processing. And, and the only reason there are two of each is one's a Word document and the other one's a PDF. Some of you might want to type and you have Word. Uh, some of you don't have Word, you just want the PDF. So whichever one is fine, We're, we'll just discuss them. We're not turning them in, we'll just be discussing them here at the end, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and break you off into rooms now. Thank you. Yep. And um, James, where are you? I'm right here. Yeah, for some reason, it still wants to put you in our room. All right, so uh, go ahead and just decline. You don't have to go into a room. All right, I think we have everybody back. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about um, let's talk about Piaget. So we we learned about Emily, right? Um, how about the first one here? So she enjoyed playing games over and over again. So according to Piaget, uh, how would that be explained by the repeated actions? Equilibrium, that's how you say it? Uh, uh, equil uh, equilibration, yes. Equil <laughs> I know it's a tough one. It doesn't roll right off the tongue. Uh, uh, so, so learning something new is what you're saying, um, that, that she's gaining mastery because something new is being introduced, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what, uh, what two forces can we uh, e explain here? If you remember accommodation. So according to, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, um, yeah, accommodation and assimilation, right? So what, what would you say she's using more of here, uh, uh, accommodation or assimilation? Is she depending on what she knows, she knows or what she's acquiring new? Assimilation. Right, right, exactly. More assimilation than anything, right? 
So how about the second one? What, what stage would you say, according to Piaget, she would be in? Pre-operational. Exactly, pre-operational. Good job. Hopefully y'all got that. Anybody else get anything different? Okay. Um, so how about the four, uh, or what are the, the main characteristics uh, of, of the stage that that you uh, kind of came to the conclusion for getting pre-operational. Like what is she yeah. exhibiting? She's exhibiting like egocentrism. Exactly, right? Yeah, Cause she thinks that by covering her eyes, uh, she can't be seen cause she can't see, right? And, and if you remember that, uh, that, that kid that was looking on the other side of the volcano, um, he was imagining what the, the uh, uh, administrator, the, the person that was on the other side, uh, he was imagining what she could see through his eyes, right? So that, that's a good in indication of uh, egocentrism, right? Uh, what else? Was there, was there something else going on there? I, I, I talked to another group and they, they, were, they kind of brought this word up. What other characteristics? Um, would it be animism? Yeah, animism and centration, absolutely. Because uh, they weren't really present in this case, right? She, she lacked that uh, uh, law of conservation, if you will, right? Absolutely. All right, how about, uh, how about number four? What'd, you, what'd your groups get for that one? Is this normal behavior? Yes. Okay. Um, my group and I said, this is very normal for her stage in development. She may have an imaginary friend, which correlates with anim animism and mm -hmm. her cognitive development and also um, egocentrism. Absolutely. And if you expand on that a little bit to Vygotsky, um, what else is going on here, would you say? Does any, did anybody catch that or anybody pick up on so when, when we're when we're doing, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, we said like inner speech and like self talk and stuff. perfect, absolutely private speech and self talk, right? Because um, we we think as as children, our thoughts are more externalized, and as we grow older, we internalize them a little bit more. So private speech is very important to to develop on those at, at those ages, right? So how about uh, how about the last one there? Um, uh, so if she's She's not yet able to conserve. Um, what'd you get? What, who got the answer for that one? What about the law? I said um, he was sort of right. Due to her age, she should begin to start um, being able to problem solve and conserve. But if her parents help her, this would help her move into concrete operational faster. Absolutely. So not only interacting with her environment, because she was going through the law of conservation. She was able to conserve uh, with some areas of her task, but not all of them, right? So she was, she was kind of going through this. But with prompting, and, and we'll kind of talk about this again when we get into attachment and social psychology uh, or, or uh, social sociocultural development. Um, we're going to see that a little bit more that yeah, we're going to see the tutor role. Remember Vygotsky talked about the tutoring role and, and uh, uh, knowing more and teaching somebody and then latching on. So that's going to take trust and, and uh, 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 communication skills. Absolutely. Um, okay. All right. I think, uh, I think we're good on that. Does anybody have any questions or anything else to add on Piaget case study? All right, so let's go to information processing. So a little bit different here. We have Byron, right? Four-year-old Byron. So what we come up with for, for number one, why is his uh, repetition important? Um, repetition is important because the more that they practice, the easier it will be for them to like retain the information and keep doing it. 
Right, right. And there are all sorts of tricks that we use in cognition. And, and maybe you can relate to this, but um, uh, maybe coming up with things that rhyme, coming up with things that uh, make sense. According to Vygotsky, again, you, you have that scaffolding where you're basing new information on, on information you already know or zone, zonal, uh, uh, zone of proximal um, information, right? Or de yeah, development. So we, we have information that we know and we're expanding upon that. So repetition is important. If you look at the information processing model in the short-term memory, we need that repetition. We need that rehearsal to occur because that reinforces, that builds the neural pathways a little stronger uh, each time that we use that. And then when we put that into uh, our long-term memory and retrieve it, we still have those neural pathways to, to work that, uh, that information, right? So, um, what about the, the, the rhyming for number two? What is the academic skills that, uh, that is uh, teaching Byron? What would you say? Maybe pronunciation skills. Okay, language, absolutely. An emphasis on language. And um, also maybe teaching different types of strategy to, to learn using the rhymings uh, and, and associating them with things that he might be interested in, such as monkeys jumping on a bed. You know, they, I think maybe some of you have, have uh, heard that rhyme before, um, but it also reinforces other skills such as counting uh, and rhyming and language. So it really covers all of those. Absolutely. Good job. Um, and how about the, the final one for information processing? So what memory strategy uh, are they using? Repetition. Right. Re right. Repetition. Again, kind of reinforcing using rhyming, using scripts, right? Uh, making it relatable. Because if we, if we said uh, uh, for Byron, he's four years old and, and we're, uh, you know, counting molecular structures, he'd probably be less interested in that. So, all right. Um, all right, any questions? Uh, how'd y'all like that case study? Was that, was that pretty good? Was that fun? All right, and again, I like case studies because it just reinforces what I talk about in, in these lectures and what you're reading in the book. All right, does anybody have any comments um, on chapter six in general before we move on? Okay, all right, so how about any questions or comments on, on what's due this week? Yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate exactly what was due this week and uh, what's expected of the groups um, firsthand. Okay. And again, if you go under content in D2L under okay. week four um, and, and the two tabs, discussion and assessments, you'll see everything that's due there. So okay. your, your discussion is going to be pack back, um, and ask one question, answer two. Uh, your assessments are going to be assignment number four, quiz number four. The group project number two, and the uh, what's the oh, oh the uh, peer evaluation, and, okay. and again I only need one submission from the group, and I need everybody to submit the uh, the peer evaluation. Okay, so don't forget that. And there's two different drop boxes for each of them. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anything else? All right, if nothing else, I'm gonna hang out. I'm gonna stop recording now.